Hello, everybody. My name is Mark, Mark Vetter. I'm the CEO of the Composite Technology Center of Airbus in Germany. We are acting as lightweight technology and innovation center. And I'm your chairman here. I'm welcoming you. Uh, it's really great. A lot of great presentations last day, but also this day. And now we are coming to the aerospace session. What's the role of composites in aerospace? We have a lot of challenges, and all of you know it. We have to come up with the challenges of sustainability, coming to a climate-neutral aviation and aerospace sector. And it's just not a concentration on the product. We have to take care about the entire industrial system. And also composites plays a big role in it. Not only for having lightweight structures, also from the production side, bringing up with new functionality. These are a lot of changes uh, and also challenges. And I'm proudly uh, introduce now a colleague of mine, it's Sue Partridge, which is the head of Wing of Tomorrow, which is a really ambitious and really challenging, uh, but also really great uh, program which develops the future wing structures, the future wing industrial systems. She is really, really experienced along the entire value chain. And yeah, Sue, where are you? A big applause. Thank you very much, Mark. Can everybody hear me? Is the microphone working? Yeah, good. Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. It's really great to be here talking to you all here at the JEC today. So thank you for thank having you me. Uh, so as Mark said, I'm Sue Partridge, um, and I am going to talk to you today about the Airbus Wing of Tomorrow program and how it fits into Airbus's overall route towards a decarbonized future. So first of all, very briefly to introduce myself with this slightly crazy photo of me. Uh, I have been working for Airbus since I was an apprentice. So Airbus is in my DNA and Airbus wings are in my DNA. And I've been very, very fortunate that through my career at Airbus, I've been able to work on many, many of our exciting and iconic products from our smallest A320 to our largest A380 programs. The only one I haven't worked on actually is our new baby, the A220. Um, one of my most exciting phases of my career was when I worked on the wings for the A320 and A330 new engine option or NEO programs. And the reason I mention that today is because in fact, the, air, the aircraft that Airbus puts into service today are already 53% more efficient than those we were putting into service a few decades ago. And these NEO aircraft that I worked on earlier in my career were, were part of our overall decarbonization story and a part of that story today. So today I'm going to talk to you about the Wing of Tomorrow program, which I am lucky enough to lead in Airbus. I have a great job. I'm, I'm very fortunate. What's the objective and what's the goals of that program? And actually, how are we progressing um, in pushing the boundaries in terms of innovation, not just on our composite technologies, but on our wing technologies overall and our industrial system. And then I'm going to link that into the Airbus roadmap for sustainability. And I'm going to try and do all of that in 10 minutes. So it's going to be very quick. So listen carefully. So let's start with a tiny bit of history. Wing of Tomorrow is focused on our next generation of aircraft when we launch them in the future. Wing of Tomorrow is a technology program. It's a, it's a demonstrator program. To be clear, this is not the wings for our next product because we haven't, haven't launched a product. It's about getting us ready. And if we look back at the, at the past for a moment, our A320 family was launched in, in the 1980s. Uh, the wings are metallic, multi-part, a lot of assembly work. They were designed for performance at the time. They were not designed at all for assembly. And the reason that they weren't op optimized for the manufacturing processes is because when we launched the program, we thought we might sell 400. And we thought that would be a good result and the business case would work. Um, 
In fact, we've delivered over 10,000 of these aircraft that are flying in service today, and there are more than 6,000 in our order backlog. So when we launch our next product and our next generation of Airbus aircraft, we will be thinking about that high rate production right from the start, and that's one of the key reasons for launching the Wing of Tomorrow program. The other key and most important part, though, of Wing of Tomorrow is you may not know that the Wing has the potential to uh, make a bigger contribution to efficiency on our next aircraft program than, than the new engine and fuel options that are available and that are likely to be available in the future. Wing gives us a huge contribution to aircraft efficiency. Aircraft efficiency means less fuel burn, less fuel burn means, means less emissions, and a huge contribution towards our roadmap, towards decarbonisation. So wings are extremely important. I would say that, wouldn't I, because I'm responsible for the Wing of Tomorrow programme, but in fact, it's true. But if we make these super high-performance wings, out of composite materials to give us that other big lever, which is the weight benefit of composites, which, of course, all of you today here at the JEC understand very well indeed. Um, we have to also be able to make them at a very high build rate and at a low cost, because if we're going to get them into service and uh, get the airlines flying these more super efficient planes in the future, we need to be able to make them at the right cost, sell them at the right price and ramp up production very quickly. So Wing of Tomorrow is an out-of-cycle development program, a technology, technology demonstrator program to prepare the future for Airbus, to develop the technologies and be able to offer those technologies as choices to future programs that follow us. And the other key ingredient, and it's great that many of the Airbus partners on the Wing of Tomorrow program are exhibiting here at the JEC, the other key ingredient of the program is we can't just get Airbus ready for the future. We need to get our supply chain ready as well. So Wing of Tomorrow has more than 40 partners globally working on developing our composite technologies and all of the other technologies we will need for these wings of tomorrow. We're making three full-scale demonstrators to bring together more than 100 different technologies and, value and validate them in a, in a representative industrial environment. So, the key ingredients of those, of those demonstrators, of our demonstrator program are, so, I talked about the fact that wings can bring a huge efficiency benefit to the aircraft of tomorrow. And you do that in very simple terms by increasing the span of the, of the wing. Very long, very slender wings give you more lift and less drag. Imagine an albatross flying on the air cur currents and cruising across the world. It looks effortless, doesn't it? They don't waste any energy at all. So we need to mimic that, but it brings a practical problem. Because if you make the wings very long, then the aircraft will be the width of a football pitch, and you still have to fit it into today's airports. So the wings will fold, and we're developing folding wingtip technology to enable us to land, fold the wings, taxi in and come to the gate. Um, so that's a very challenging and interesting part of the program. We're looking at a different way to assemble wings, much more modular, bringing together pre-equipped modules and integrating them together in assembly. We're looking at avoiding in-tank working where we have to uh, work inside the wing at all during the assembly process. Very, very key objective of the program, and of course of interest here at the JEC, is cost-effective composite structures. And we're working hard with our partners, the material suppliers, and our aerostructures partners to understand what's the best composite technology for us, and how do we make that into the components in the, in the best integrated way. Uh, and we're looking at, by integrating these components and really leveraging the benefits of composites, reducing our part count and reducing mm. our fast, the amount of fastness that we put into our wings. And finally, we're looking at, again, yeah. some of you may not be aware that the wings are the fuel tanks of the aircraft and are full of systems. They, are, they have a lot of systems inside them. And that brings a lot of complexity and a lot of cost. So how can we um, approach the whole question of integrating systems into our structures in a new way to make it more efficient um, and to, to enable us no, to achieve high rate and low cost. Half, half so it, it's a very quick 
a very um, quick summary of all of the main we'll ingredients of Wing of Tomorrow, but hopefully I'm giving you a flavour of, of the complexity uh, of the challenge and the many, many different mm -hmm. aspects that we're looking at as a programme. And it really is a global programme, as I said, involving eight of our Airbus sites, techno centres across Europe and suppliers across the world. So in terms of the composite side of things, which I guess it's important for me to talk about here today, on our full-scale wing uh, demonstrators, which, as I said before, we're making three, uh, we are using dry fiber infusion and uh, also RTM technology. So um, today's Airbus products, the A350 and the A400M, are, do have composite wings. They are pre-preg and, and really probably a more conventional technology. We're looking forward at um, exploring the option to use dry fiber, uh, understanding what cost benefits that might bring, understanding the trade between tape laying and NCF blankets to see if we can improve our deposition rates, and also looking at how we can make uh, the quality and the repeatability of the components even better by exploring closed mold tooling through resin transfer molding. We're exploring out of autoclave technologies, which of course would be a very good sustainability benefit because it will reduce the amount of energy that we use in our production system. Um, and we're trying to understand how far we want to go in terms of highly integrated components. So instead of making many, many smaller compo composite components and fastening them together in the way you would a metallic wing, we know with composites we have the potential to, to co-cure uh, components together in integrated structures. We're exploring the best way to do that and whether that gives us benefits compared with fabrication. Um, and we're looking at net shape or near net shape components to avoid the need for uh, post-cure machining. So many different uh, kind of boundaries we're trying to explore with our composite uh, components on our full-scale wing demonstrators working with our partners um, and actually we have one of those full-scale components here today at the at the JEC uh, on the GKN um, stand our GKN partners have brought their full-scale spa to the JEC so if you haven't seen that you might want to go and have a have a look at that later on um, we're also though uh, it's key that we wing of tomorrow offer our company options for the future because we don't know what the right technology is. That's what we're here to find out. So in parallel to our three full-scale demonstrators, we're also keeping our options open by exploring both in and out of autoclave pre-preg technologies. We're looking at different materials and, and uh, things like 3D woven technologies. And we are also looking at thermoplastics as well as thermosets for certain applications. So a real menu of options so that we can choose whichever one of those that we feel is best for our next programs. So where are we today? Well, we have uh, made all of the primary and secondary structure components for our three demonstrators. Uh, we have already completed the assembly of our first wing box demonstrator, um, and that's been assembled at our Broughton wing plant in North Wales in the UK, uh, which is where all of the wings for all of the Airbus aircraft are manufactured. And it's been designed by the team at our Field Airbus Filton site, also in the UK, in the southwest of the UK, which is the home of Airbus wing design. We are preparing our test facility, ready to test one of those wing boxes and do a full-scale structural test on one of those wing boxes. And we have also progressed very well through the folding wingtip development, and we are preparing our first ground-based demonstrator test for our folding wingtip technology as well. So it's very, very real, and it's very, very exciting. And that's Wing of Tomorrow. I just want to quickly, though, before I finish, touch on how does that fit into Airbus's overall journey towards a decarbonized future? Because we really, in Airbus, are proud of the fact that we feel we are leading the journey towards clean aerospace. So aviation's next big challenge is all about how we can decarbonize and meet our target 
to reach uh, net zero by 2050. And we need many, many ingredients for that challenge. I've just talked to you about how wings can contribute to the efficiency of the airframe. And I've also mentioned that our aircraft that we're building today are already significantly more um, efficient than the, than the aircraft we used to deliver a few decades ago. But there are other ingredients. We're obviously working very hard on um, fuels and on other technologies to, to, to take us forward and to lead that that route through this very, very challenging problem to address our climate crisis as a globe. Many different aspects which are kind of shown on this, on this slide. So the pink area I've talked about really, technology and design, how can we make the aircraft more efficient and really, and really uh, address that. Two different aspects on fuel, sustainable aviation fuel. So sustainable aviation fuel, all of the Airbus aircraft today are certified to fly with 50% sustainable aviation fuel already. And by 2030, we intend to have all Airbus aircraft certified to fly with 100% sustainable aviation fuels. In fact, the biggest challenge with sustainable aviation fuel will be the global challenge to manufacture enough fuel to feed the fleet in service. And the other orange... Um, orange uh, hexagon on this slide is hydrogen. Airbus has launched the Zero E program and stated its clear ambition to put a hydrogen powered aircraft into service by 2035. And that's another huge technology program running alongside Wing of Tomorrow within Airbus today. There are then other contributors like the way the aircraft is operated in the air and on the ground at the airports and also other market-based measures. It's a huge challenge and it needs a plan with many, many ingredients in order to make it deliver. So here's our overall timeline. First of all, as I said, to reach 20, by 2030, the ability to fly all our aircraft on 100% SAF. Also, by 2035, to be the first major manufacturer to put a zero E aircraft into service powered by hydrogen. And we are laser focused on the ATAG roadmap to decarbonisation aviation by 2050. Airbus really is proud of its ambition in this area and we really are leading the way. So thank you very much. Okay. So thank you so much for this inspiring and also impressive vision you made. Um, we have the chance to answer uh, questions afterwards. We will directly continue with the next speaker. Um, the next speaker is Virginique Chaquet, and she's coming from Safran Aircraft um, Engines and will present a really visionary um, open fan concept. And what's really important for us as the composite industry, what's the role of the composite materials there? Um, I proudly present now Virginique. Come on the stage, please. Big hand of applause for Virginique. Okay, Thank you for the introducing. Yeah. And there was a, there's a time uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, Dr. De Jérôme Bonini had planned to make this presentation, but unfortunately, he can't be there today, so uh, I will pass it, and uh, he apologized uh, not to be here with you today. So the presentation is about uh, tomorrow's propulsion and Safran uh, wants to be a leader in the transformation of uh, the aeronautic and to play a major, um, and to be a major contributor in uh, the development of sustainable aviation. So, in 2021, uh, all the commercial aeronautic uh, industries are committed to uh, reach uh, by 2050 uh, 
the uh, net zero CO2 emission. So there is a roadmap that it proposed, and four levels had been uh, identified in order to reach uh, this target. The first one is to develop uh, ultra-efficient aircraft. Uh, we can imagine uh, uh, more efficiency uh, engine, uh, new materials, new materials, uh, lighter components, and of course, electrization of the, of the engine. This uh, labor uh, lead to 40% of um, reduction of CO2. The second lever that is a high, uh, that, is have, that have a high contribution is the development and the massive uh, use of sustainable aircraft fuel. Uh, this uh, level weight on 50% of the decarbonization of the aircraft. Then we have uh, the optimization of the air traffic, about 10%, and uh, we need to find other uh, action uh, to target the zero uh, emission of CO2 at uh, 20, uh, 2050. So at Safran, uh, we work um, to decarbonize the population and uh, has the electric won't be uh, full in the, in the engine before 2040. Uh, we have to optimize, optimize uh, our engine and to, uh, to manage the fuel consumption. So in order to, uh, to get the efficient uh, engine, we have uh, two, um, two possibilities. We can, uh, we can optimize the core efficiency with increasing the overall pressure ratio. Uh, this, uh, this is directly linked to uh, the turbine, uh, the low pressure and the high pressure turbine and the, uh, the compression. Uh, when uh, this uh, overall pressure ratio increases, the efficiency of uh, the core and the engine will increase. On the other end, we have to improve the propulsive um, efficiency. And to improve the propulsive efficiency, we have to increase the bypass radio. Uh, this is the ratio uh, between the flux uh, that gives the thrust in the engine and the flux that will uh, cross the turbine. So, uh, in order to improve uh, the propulsive uh, efficiency, uh, there is a new architecture uh, without casing around the fan. Uh, when we test this, um, this architecture, we can uh, increase the bypass ratio. And for example, uh, in the case you show here, I show you here, uh, we can increase this bypass ratio from 10 for a leap, so the leap is our engine reference today, to 70. And uh, with that, we will improve uh, the, the engine, and uh, we perform in uh, 2017 a grand taste with this type of uh, technology that is called counter-rotating propeller, and it reveals a gain of 15 in terms of CO2 versus the leap. So the difference between the leap is that we eliminate the casing around the fan, and uh, as we eliminate it, we can improve uh, the, um, the profiler, the size of the profiler, and improve uh, the uh, bypass ratio. These uh, profilers are made in a composite, and uh, the difference between the leap and the, this uh, test is the size of the profiler. In order to have the good thrust, we, uh, um, the size is um, 14 feet uh, 
beside uh, four, uh, six, seven uh, feet for the lip. Uh, with increasing this, um, this uh, size of profiler, the, <coughs> the, we use we use two uh, profilers in order to avoid too big a size of profiler to get the good trust. So it was two profilers that rotative in an inverse sense. In order to optimize each uh, the efficiency, um, efficiency, the core efficiency is a propulsive uh, efficiency, we use a power, a power gear that uh, lead to uh, a low speed for the profiler that is better for the um, propulsive um, efficient and a high speed of the uh, turbine. Uh, voilà. So uh, this demonstration reveals uh, uh, the <coughs> The diminution, the, the, uh, the diminution of uh, CO2, uh, emission, uh, CO2, but also the good result was about the noise because uh, this technical without casing uh, can provoke a uh, high level of noise. And uh, we can uh, see with this test that when we dimension it correctly, uh, the, the blade and the acoustic uh, uh, we can uh, reach a uh, 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 level of noise uh, acceptable. So it was in uh, 2017. Now, um, in uh, 2021, uh, GE and Safran decide, decided to launch the CFM RISE program. It is a program, uh, RISE uh, means Innovation for Sustainable Engine. And the target of this program is to uh, decrease 20% uh, uh, emission of CO2 and 30% uh, fuel consumption. It is based on several, uh, several key points. The first uh, key point is uh, so a new advancing uh, architecture that it's called open fan associated to advanced materials. Uh, so, the, the new architecture, a lot of architecture had been um, evaluated, and the best one selected uh, is based on the counter, the counter rotating propeller, but with uh, simplification and optimization, with just one profiler that will turn, and then uh, some um, outlet git bands. Uh, to to get the flu to better give the the flux, uh, the fact that there's no two profiler is better and easier for the integration. Uh, associated to this uh, advanced architecture of engine, uh, we will need and we will use some advanced material like uh, composite. All the technologies that will be uh, developed will be uh, one, uh, full compatible of um, sustainable aircraft uh, fuel and hydrogen capability. Uh, this program uh, ba is based on uh, a lot of demonstration, uh, technology maturation, ground flight tests for um, a service of the of the engine at um, 2035. In um, last year, uh, Airbus, Safran, and GE decided to plan a flight demonstrator on an Airbus A380. This Airbus will integrate uh, one open um, one open fan in order to demonstrate. Uh, the capability of the new propulsion and uh, this, the integration also uh, of uh, the, this new uh, architecture and uh, the open fan will be uh, put under the wheel. Uh, when we develop this type of uh, new architecture, we have to do it with the aircraft manufacturer because as the size is uh, 
uh, increase, as the size of the fund is increased, uh, we, uh, it must, uh, we, it is uh, more difficult to integrate it on, uh, on planes that it was, that was not, uh, pre, uh, that was not uh, managed for it. So what are the wise technology? First, in order to improve the, the um, propulsive efficiency, we use some uh, composite blade. Uh, so they are very, uh, the, di the diameter is very high. And uh, we, we, we want that the composite blade uh, integrates the function of reverse of reverse. Uh, we have so the uh, outlet lead vans with a pitch control mechanism PCM in order to, uh, to, to manage, to better manage the flux. Uh, this technology <coughs> um, has the, the profiler is optimized. The speed of the profiler is very low. Uh, we have to incorporate in our composite uh, some solution to de-ice, to de-ice. And um, as we don't have any casing around our composite, uh, it, is, uh, imp it is important to dimension it uh, with a noise level, acoustic, um, with acoustic. And for certificate this new technology, uh, we have to, to work with uh, the authority and the um, aircraft manufacturer uh, because um, the, the behavior of this, this type of bed will be different, uh, especially uh, on um, injection. So that was composite. That lead, uh, to, uh, that lead uh, for the engine to improve uh, the propulsive uh, efficient. Now, <coughs> uh, before the, the profiler, uh, we have the, 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 um, the core, we have the core of the engine, and uh, <coughs> we develop some compact booster and low pressure system uh, associated to a reduction uh, gearbox. So uh, the, the turbine, the low pressure turbine can, um, can have high speed and uh, more there is compression, more there is speed, more the temperature, uh, will, the, the temperature will increase to have a good uh, efficient. So we need some, uh, some materials that accept this uh, high temperature and CMC is um, a key point to, um, to manage this, uh, this temperature. So it is for the low pressure turbine. For the high pressure turbine, we will also use some CMC. And uh, if we need to, to cool how part, uh, some advanced car technology will be, uh, will be used. So to improve um, to improve the propulsive efficiency of uh, our engine, uh, we will uh, need to use a composite uh, first on the propeller that gave the thrust, and then uh, on the turbine uh, high pressure and low pressure turbine with uh, the CMC, because the CMC can um, have have good properties at high temperature, and we can uh, avoid cooling some parts. Uh, for example, uh, the, at uh, the high pressure turbine, uh, generally, when it is not CMC, it is uh, super alloy based nickel, and um, we need to cool them, and they are, uh, they are, the, the weight is, above <laughs> CMC. So it is with new architecture and new uh, advanced materials that we can uh, uh, 
that, that we can um, reduce uh, the consumption of uh, fuel and uh, the emission of CO2. Thank you very much. Eugenie, thank you so much for this quite interesting speech, but also for this promising concept for this new engine generation. Um, again, a big hand of applause for Virginie and for this presentation. Thank you. Now we will come also to a woman, which is coming from vertical aerospace. She's head of structures here. And I welcome Alison Green. Alison, come on the stage. Big hand of applause for Alison. And Alison will present vertical aerospace, of course, yes. but she will also speak about the impact of composites on the advanced air mobility and urban air mobility. Yes. I'm really looking forward to this quite interesting speech. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. That's a lot of pressure. So, um, my name is Alison Green. I'm from Vertical Aerospace. I need to get the clicker. I've forgotten it. Uh, so, um, for those of you that haven't heard of us, we make urban mobi air mobility vehicles. Um, there's a few e-vitals, actually, as I've walked around stands uh, that you can see out there. So, um, why are we doing this? I need to read this because I was up at 4 a.m. this morning and I'll get it wrong otherwise. So at Vertical, we aim to revolutionize the way people travel for a more sustainable future. And what this is, what this company does, is it makes electric um, four-seater taxis that will carry people on routes from airports to uh, main trunks such as London. So the idea of them is that you will work uh, uh, or walk, um, sorry, you'll fly from JFK to London Heathrow, and then you will take this vertical taxi and uh, go from Heathrow to Canary Wharf. It will shorten your transport time from maybe an hour and 15 minutes to maybe 15 to 20 minutes but the other thing is it's completely zero carbon so these are completely battery powered aircraft um, the advanced urban air mobility um, uh, market could be a one trillion dollar market there are a lot of players in this market as well so there's about 300 plus people trying to do this because of this potential revenue that it could um, bring them and um, so there's a lot of different sort of concepts that you'll see. There's a lot of different um, uh, sort of uh, ways that people are doing this. But obviously, I'm going to say that Vertical are one of the ones that are in the top 10. We're really looking at how we're doing it. And one of the reasons why I say that, and I, I only half joke when I say that, is that we are not trying to make a flying car. We are trying to make a certifiable aircraft. And that's how I'm going to talk about how we use composites. Uh, so we are based in the UK, in Bristol. Um, we have about 300 employees globally, so we do have employees around the world, but our main headquarters are in Bristol. Um, the VX4, which is our aircraft that you saw the renders of before, uh, is capable of carrying five people, but one of those is a, is a pilot. Potentially, these things could be automotive, automated, but... Generally, the public don't like the idea of flying objects that don't have pilots in. So we have gone for the pilot to start off with. Uh, it will take four passengers in the back. It can do a cruise speed of about 150 miles per hour, a range of about 100 miles, fully dis um, driven by the batteries, really, and the capability of the batteries. It will be 10 times quieter than a helicopter. So we're aiming for in um, cruise for it to be about 50 decibels. So it will be very, very quiet and zero carbon emissions, as I said before. 
the other thing that we're very, very proud of at Vertical is that we have actually got our DOA from the CAA. So our regulatory body is the CAA in the UK. Uh, and uh, only a few weeks ago, we received our certificate for our DOA. Um, we're the first eVTOL company that CAA have given a, a DOA to. So we're remarkably proud of that. Um, and uh, we are still working with EASA and uh, the FAA and also uh, JCAB in Japan uh, to make sure that what we're looking to certify and our certification basis is acceptable to all those bodies as well. So, I talk a lot about flying cars and I talk about different ways of doing things. So at Vertical, we look at doing things slightly differently. A lot of our supplier, our, our competitors are trying to do everything in-house, but we've really gone for strategic partnerships because we only, uh, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of brilliant companies out there, and a few of them are here, uh, like, um, for example, GKN, Solve, Leonardo, Ira Structures, that really know what they're doing. So what we want to do is partner with them so they can bring their, their sort of experience in the industry and bring it into making this type of aircraft. Um, the other partnerships we have are Molly Cell for battery cells, um, Hanwha for some of the mechanical stuff, um, Rolls Royce for the electrical uh, power units, and Honeywell for the flight control um, uh, flight control laws as well. Um, so we really have gone for a more partnership type strategy, which is very different from a lot of our competitors, but we feel this is what will help us get the certified aerospace grade product, which is a really key thing with these types of vehicle. So this is the VA um, one X, it's a prototype of the X4. You can see, and I do recognize it's not a huge amount of space between the ground and the air, but it is flying in this picture here. So this aircraft was um, a full-scale prototype, so it was capable of carrying the five passengers, um, and, a pi uh, and it had the pilot in as well. You can't actually see him in that, in that picture, but it has only flown with a crew in there, so it's only, we have only done piloted flights. Um, and it flew last year in, in the summer, uh, well, I think actually it's early autumn um, in September, and... Um, it was flying in, a, in Kemble Airport, which is based in Gloucester. And, you know, uh, this aircraft prototype itself took us about... It took us about 15 to 18 months to actually get it in the air. And that's from a blank sheet of paper. So it's a remarkable sort of achievement for us to do. And I'll talk a bit later about some of the ways we managed to do that, because it is different from a certified aircraft. Um, so how do we use composites? Composites are used sort of in aerospace for lightweight, but in UAM, there are some other sort of critical things that we have to think about. But one of the things that we really have to think about is it's all about balance. When you are head of structures, as I'm lucky to be um, a vertical, you get lots of people showing all the technologies. And it's very, very easy for you to come a little bit fixated with trying to do all these crazy, amazing things. And there are some amazing technologies out there. But what I have to think about when we're selecting what composite to use is balancing everything. So it is all about balance. I have to think about time and whether you know, we've got enough time to do it. I have to think about whether it's going to be lightweight enough, um, whether it's certifiable, whether the authorities will give us the actual certificate to fly if we do it that way. Um, then, longer term, I also have to be thinking about rates because the projected rates of this type of aircraft, we're looking at maybe 300 plus a month. So the ways that we build it have to be aerospace grade, but we may have to think of different ways of how we actually assembly, uh, assemble and manufacture them. Um, and then the other thing that's very important, we are a green company. We have to think about sustainability. So the materials that we choose and the way that we use them has to be sustainable as well. So a good example of balance and some of the things I have to think about are our rotor blades or our propellers. So they're all in-house designed um, and they are made out of composite. And if you do want to see one, I uh, ask you to go to the Solvay stand, I think in Hall 5, because we do actually have one of our um, composite generation one blades uh, displayed there. Now this blade is all about balance. 
because what I have to do is produce an impact-resistant, um, crack or fatigue damage tolerant uh, uh, blade, but they also want it to be very quiet. So for it to be quiet, it also has to be flexible. And then on top of that, they want it to be lightweight. All of those things contradict each other. So we have to get the right balance of what we can do at, the at that particular time in order to meet the schedule of what the company needs to do. And it can be really, really difficult because you could spend years trying to do everything perfectly. But ultimately, if you do that, you're never going to fly anything. You're never going to do anything. The picture I showed you of the aircraft flying is amazing, but it still needs work. And what we're using it for is to get data so we can make the next aircraft better, which we've already started building. Um, so it really is about balance. It's about using sort of the right things at the right time. Ooh. So I talked a little bit about prototypes. And when we make prototypes, it's a very different mentality to when we make a certification aircraft. And there's a lot of different things that we have to consider. So when I'm making a prototype, if you take material, for example, we have to use something that's available because there's cost constraints, there's availability, uh, and then there's the data available. So my background is that I used to work for Airbus. I used to be used to loads of material data available to me just like that. When I moved to vertical, none of that exists anymore. You don't have that sort of luxury of having all of that there. You have to generate it yourself. So you have to look at what's available in the market. What data is there? What is the best material to use? Um, and we used um, MTM45 for the prototype that I showed you uh, because it gave us enough strength and it, gave, it had enough data for us to be able to use it. Then um, when you look at a qualification, though, for a certification aircraft, then you have a little bit more flexibility to actually go for something that meets your requirements. So the material that we're looking at for this aircraft is an NCAMT um, qualified material. It has a lot more damage tolerance um, in the resin because these types of aircraft have a lot of vibration in there. So we really need to look at the crack propagation. But it still needs a bit of work. So we're still doing the qualification now. We also can look at different types of materials for certification, which I couldn't have considered for a prototype because there wasn't enough time. So things like thermoplastics, 3D printing, um, there are the sort of things that we're looking at for the certification aircraft. But you keep having to go back to the circle that I showed before, which you can see on the top, uh, at the bottom right-hand corner there. Um, it's, it's all about balance. If you try to certify a crazy new material that the authorities have not heard of in a novel type of aircraft, the chance of that happening is very, very low. So you have to get the right balance again. Uh, then if you look at um, conventional processes so, and, and what processes are used to make these types of aircraft, if you have a prototype, you really need to go as hand layup. The aircraft that you saw was purely hand laid up because if we'd gone for automated processing, if we'd gone for something fancy, again, we probably would not have any prototypes flying. When we go towards certification, we have a lot more sort of flexibility of what we're looking at because there's a bit more time to do the certification. But again, it's about the balance. You cannot go crazy. So we will be looking at bonding because these aircraft are really driven by weight and bonding gives us a, a weight advantage. However, Again, authorities generally are quite nervous about bonding. So if I go for a fully bonded aircraft, then I may not get it certified. So I have to look at that balance. Um, then if you look at schedule for the prototype, the way we get money into the company, because we're not selling anything, is to fly. If we fly, if we make prototypes, we get revenue. Um, so we have very, very strict schedule constraints. And I mentioned before, the first aircraft that we've made was a blank sheet of paper 15 months later in an assembled aircraft. And a few months after commissioning, it flew. That's a remarkably quick schedule for an aerospace company. Um, and we also got a flight um, permit to fly from the CAA as well. So it wasn't 
you know, it wasn't an experimental flight. It had a proper flight permit um, to do that, that flight. So there was a lot of work to go into that, but also there was a lot of compromises that we had to make and we had to uh, reduce flight envelopes to make sure that the authorities were comfortable with what we're doing. Um, when we go for certification, then schedule is a factor in this, but it's not the major factor it is necessarily for a prototype because we need to also find an optimized solution that will give us longevity and the safety that we need to show this aircraft is safe. Um, then I talk a little bit about manufacturers that we use as well. Um, so for the prototype again, um, we used more sort of smaller manufacturers that had availability that could knock up something quicker for us. Um, and, you know, it, it, it was good enough for what we needed to do for a prototype, but not many, I think none of them had the actual aerospace accreditation that we'd need to do if we were going for a certified product. So it really is about balance in UAM. We have to make sure that we're picking the right materials for what we need to do. The other thing about composites is that we really have to utilize what they're made for because we have a habit in um, aerospace of doing maybe what we call black metal where we'll just make something like a metallic aircraft, but we just can't do that with UAM because it will be overweight and it will never take off. So there's a lot of methods and processes that we're developing and validating to show how we can utilize the, uh, and make the best use out of composite materials. So my final kind of message, and I think I'm just about on time here, is when you're thinking about UAM, you have to think about balance, but finding the right solution of what you're making is really, really important, and that's the key thing that we have to think about when we're doing it. That's it, thank you. Thanks for listening, everyone. Great, Alison. Thank you so much. A lot of work to do, and the best thing is, uh, it's a lot of work also for the composite industry. Now we will come to our Q&A session, and I again welcome Sue and also Virginique on stage. Please, a big hand of applause for them. And we can start now with the first questions. Please raise your hand when you have a question and wait until the hostess is coming to you. Um, yeah, let's start. Is there any question in the audience? Yeah. Hello. Uh, uh, hello. Um, it was very productive uh, presentation from uh, my point of view. And I was very impressed about the Airbus uh, Wing of Tomorrow because I knew that this has been program. Uh, this program has been started uh, for a while. And uh, my question would be um, because the Airbus is considering high rate about maximum 100 ships per month. So based on the the new technology, so wondering that what is the current status to make uh, 100 ships per month? It's hard to, it's really hard to hear. For me. Yeah. Can, can you repeat the last sentences again? Okay. So uh, the question is uh, the readiness of the uh, wing of technology uh, to have a uh, 100 step per month. So high rate. It's a high rate. The rate. High rate. High rate. High rate. Yes. 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 And the question about high rate, sorry, for wing of tomorrow, it's quite hard to hear you. I'm really sorry. What rate uh, per month? I guess. Readiness. Readiness to make uh, 100 step per month how you can make uh, 100 ships ship per month with uh, this uh, new composite wing technology. Okay, so I think your question is how will we achieve high rates of 100 aircraft yes, per month right. with these composites technologies, yes? Is that correct? Yes. Thank you. I guess it's for me then. Would you like to answer <laughs> it? <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, so I mean that's part of the reason for doing the Wing of Tomorrow program in the first place because if you look at A350, for example, um, we have been up to rates of about 10 per month on an A350, where we know on single aisle in the future we want to be capable of going to rate 100 per month. So we're looking at automation in terms of uh, deposition. We're looking at different logistics processes. We're looking at how we bring the wing together in a different way to, ena to enable the automation with a completely different build philosophy. 
Um, and we're look, obviously looking at working very, very closely with our supply chain on both the materials and the aerostructures side of things to see how we can make those assembly and component manufacturing processes as rate capable as possible. We're also using digitalization a lot to model and, prov and uh, to produce digital twins so that we understand how we predict the factory of the future to look and then validating that through our demonstrator program. So that again, like I said in my speech, there's many different ingredients that need to come together to, to, to prepare us for those high rate scenarios. Okay, is there any other question in the audience? Here. So I'm Bala from Hexagon. Thanks a lot uh, for your presentation. Um, I'm quite impressed uh, to see the ramp up, what you have shown, uh, high rate, so it's generally for everyone in the panel. Uh, so this is for me, if I just see the sustainability point of view, just the one direction. So do you have any plans to close the loop? For example, if you're producing 100 aircrafts per month and um, down the line, two years, you will be having like thousands of aircraft in the line and then you need to also think of closing the cycle, recycling, the old parts and then putting it in the new loop for the new generation of the vehicles. Is there anything that you are working also proactively in, in uh, closing the loop? Yeah, maybe I can answer it uh, from the Airbus perspective. Or no, no, I can book? answer it. Would you want me yeah. to answer it again? Please, please, do it. Me, yeah. please do it. So, um, again, it's quite hard to hear the questions because of the background noise. So even if you have the microphone, if you could speak really loudly, it really helps. Um, I think your question is you were surprised to, to, uh, to see the need to ramp up very steeply and that we may uh, be in a position where we have a lot of inventory in the supply chain during the ramp up. I think that was your question. I, can't, I really can't hear you. I, I'm sorry. The second it's... one was how we want to close the gap. The recycling. Uh, to come to, so a, to, come the to a circle. Yep. The end-of-life aircrafts or the parts from the end-of-life aircrafts and the new generation of the aircrafts that you will be manufacturing in the next generations. Okay. Um, so in terms of ramp-up, one of the, again, it's a similar answer really, one of the main reasons for doing Wing of Tomorrow is we know that when Airbus does make a decision to launch a next generation aircraft, we really will need to be ready with mature technologies because once we do launch it, we will want to ramp up quickly and, and uh, there will be a high demand for the product. So Wing of Tomorrow is about preparing those technologies out of cycle as a, as a technology program in order to de-risk that ramp up. But it will be a big challenge because we know that during that early phase of any aircraft development, there is change to manage. So again, we're looking at different ways, for example, on composite tooling, is there a way to manage um, if we needed to change the tooling partway through the ramp up? What's the best way to de-risk that? So we're looking at those kind of key drivers that we know from experience can be difficult during, during the ramp up phase. In terms of the cutover from old to new, I mean, when, when we do launch the next generation of aircraft, we will be cutting over from our current A320 family to, to a new future generation aircraft. So it will be a, a, you know, a complete next generation. So there, there won't really be, there will be a ramp down and a ramp up. Um, but the current wings obviously are metallic wings and, and we'll be moving to composite. So, so it, will be, it will be very much like that. Okay. Thank you, Sue. Thank you for these questions. We are running out of time, unfortunately. But there is a chance to meet us afterwards in front of this area. I would like to thank all our speakers. Uh, it was really great to have these three amazing women here on stage. Uh, a big applause for them. I would, I would like also to thank you uh, for the attention. Uh, you was a really great audience. And I would also to thank the great team of JC for organizing it, for inviting us. Thank you so much. Please stay here because afterwards there is a big ceremony for the startup booster. Stay here just in a few minutes, it starts. So many cool startups, so many cool ideas. Um, I wish you a good stay today, but also a good fair during the next day. Thank you. <laughs>